Would you quit? You're making it so blurry. <sighs> oh my gosh. Look at the bird. I know, we have a nest <clears throat> up there and now there's all over our front porch. They poop on the chairs out there. On our chairs. And on the car. It's really a beautiful thing to have all these birds, but I know. they are kind of... They're loud. Loud. They are very loud. I was teaching a group last night and they're like, bam, bam. It's chatty. What do you think they're saying to each other? Well, they're communicating because they love each other. You think certain pitches of a bird's <sighs> chirp means that they're angry? No. Or they're mating? Or Maybe. they're calling in There's their mates. There's probably mating involved. They're the bluebird is my favorite guy because he's got like a little bit of a mohawk and he just waddles around the yard like this. I'm actually <clears throat> deeply curious mm. about what they're doing when they're chirping. I'm going to look this up. I will report back with an answer. I think they're just maybe chatting to one another about their lives. <laughs> I know, but have you ever maybe stopped and Maybe they're verbal like, processors. Maybe they are, like you. Yeah. <laughs> and I bet you there's an introverted bird out there that's just saying, can we have silence, please? <laughs> Space be, in please silence. stop chirping at me? <laughs> I know all about that. <laughs> what is up, everyone? Yeah, right. You love chatting. <laughs> I do. Watch Welcome. How much you chat in this video. I know. Watch Welcome to our YouTube <laughs> channel. Um, if you don't know, we're Kara and Caleb. I'm Kara. And I'm Caleb. <laughs> All right. Actually, before before we begin, before we begin, uh -huh. um, <clears throat> we are settling into Nashville. We moved here how long ago? Three, four, February. March, March, April, April. April. three so months ago. Three months ago. Um, it's been a whirlwind, but it's been did a good... Did you say whirlwind? Whirlwind. Whirlwind. What did I say? I thought you said whirlwind. Oh, shame. That's some more No, it's not a shame. <laughs> it has been a whirlwind. It has been. But uh, been we're actually <clears throat> settling in, uh, making new friends. We had some friends here already, too, but we're now we're making new friends. Yeah. We actually just went to Arrington Vineyards, which was pretty cool. <laughs> Honey, it's delicious. Do you want to try some? It was gorgeous. It's like this open vineyard. There's two sides, actually. Yeah. We went to the barn side and they had live music and they had like froze wine and we just brought a huge picnic full of lots yeah, and lots and lots of snacks and laid around and listened to music and ate snacks. Yeah. It was good time. too because it was overcast. <clears throat> oh yeah. This guy, me. Yeah. I don't do well when it's just really hot and sunny. Mm. Um, I have a hard time. These muscles kind of get too sweaty. <laughs> no. In this kind of environment. If when it's hot and when it's really sunny, for whatever reason, my allergies yeah. kick the <laughs> heck out of me. Um, but needless to say, Arrington Vineyards was amazing. It's a must do. It's a must do. If you visit Nashville. If you visit so Nashville, cute. visit Arrington. Yes. Uh, but that is not the point of today's uh, video. On today's video, we actually want to have kind of a, a brief conversation and we're uh, barely probably skimming the top of this conversation for both of us. We're just going to open the can. Yeah, open the can. And we want to have a conversation around purity culture um, and how it has affected us. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about what purity culture is. Yes. We're going to give you a little 90-second synopsis. <clears throat> and then we're going to talk about how it affected each of us personally. Yeah. Maybe two or three ways that it had an impact on us. And then we're going to talk about some practical tools that can help you walk away from or unravel some of the stuff that came from purity culture. Because what we know now is that there's there's been a lot of damage done and a lot of destruction yeah. happened um, for people's sense of identity, people's view of sex, all of that in the purity culture movement. So we're going to unpack some healthy ways to heal. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I'm just thinking about how like my experience with purity culture, and I'm not going to get into it, but... Yeah. Yeah, it kind of has blended into every facet of life. 100% because right? it's, a, it's a way of viewing the world. Right. And so it has, it's just didn't like do this, this, and this to me. It actually warped my entire life experience until I got curious enough and to ask like, why am I doing this or why has this happened? Mm -hmm. And so much, and we'll talk a little bit about this, mm -hmm. so much of my healing <laughs> journey has been getting to a lot of the root 
trauma that's created a, a sense of shame yeah. in my life and so much of the shame that I have lived with um, that has damaged, deeply damaged and um, have left me feeling so stuck and disconnected in my life comes from purity culture. Yeah. It comes from shame around my sexuality. Yeah. We can debrief some of that, but I feel like the whole movement was yes. built on shame. So yeah. that makes so sense. So what is purity culture? <clears throat> what is purity culture? So purity culture is a movement that started by was started by the evangelical church in the 90s, and it was created really to promote abstinence before marriage. So it kind of came as a reaction to the 70s and 80s, which were like a little more free sex hippie movements. So in the church, or in the 90s, the church buckled down and they were like, let's get really adamant on promoting sex in the context of marriage is good and sex outside of marriage is bad. So in this movement, you had campaigns like True Love Waits. You had purity pledges where you'd go to a conference and you'd... <laughs> I had the ring. This. I got like the ring. Yep. They had purity rings. Yeah. But purity pledges where you would literally sign your name to commit to your virginity until you were married. And in all of this, uh, you, you were really... You were getting a, a view of sex that's binary, right? So you were right. getting this view that sex before marriage is bad and sex in the context of marriage is good. And and there really was no gray, there's no conversation outside of that. So it's interesting because purity culture also really bled into normal culture. So even if you didn't grow up in the evangelical church, you were probably affected by purity culture. But did you say this? I'm not joking. Like it really did um, kind of form, or I guess purity culture really solidified as I'm thinking about it, that sex outside, it's sin. It's sin. It's sin, right? Yeah. So it's outside of marriage, mm -hmm. sex, is sin and so therefore when you say it bled into culture yeah now it's interesting then because when you see the world talking about sex right all of this is very sinful mm -hmm. right and then i'm just thinking of that what's that old scripture like i am of the world but not, not i'm in the in world, the world but not, not of it. the world it's like an, it's a 90s band like avalon do you remember yeah. the christian band avalon yeah. <laughs> anyway so it bled into uh it bled into modern day culture so you had pop stars talking about Purity. Mm -hmm. You had Jessica Simpson and Britney Spears talking about their purity on national television. So it kind of bled into all these areas of life. One of the parts that, uh, we'll, we'll get into some of the destruction, but one of the parts that is so destructive about it is that <clears throat> because it, it split sex into this binary view, like this mm -hmm. is good, this is bad, you now have these two camps of people, the pure pe people and the impure people. So if you were someone who crossed over the line and had sex outside of marriage, you're now thrown into this impure camp damaged goods damaged goods which i'll touch on but really oh. quickly over here is the pure camp if you haven't had sex before marriage you're you're a liar you're a cheater you're a stealer you're a horrible human being but if you haven't had sex before marriage you you get to remain in the pure camp so really destructive languaging around that with this uh with this impure camp just uh damaged goods mm -hmm. what happened in some of the campaigns and you can speak to this too they would pass around like a piece of chewed gum a youth pastor would pass around a piece of chewed gum or you said a flower like a rose and smack have everybody like smash it up or show the chewed gum and they would say if, if you've had sex this is what you now are to your husband or no like i remember it was the uh the the, the rose when you pass around the rose and everybody's like smell it you know touch it like really rub on the rose uh -huh. and then like the pastor got up and he, the whole crescendo of it was like and now who wants this rose? Like who wants this rose after you've been passed around and you've been touched by everyone? Like yeah. who wants this rose? <laughs> so what we have to acknowledge <sighs> is I feel like there was probably a lot of ignorant youth pastors who didn't know the damage they were doing. But if you think about this message long-term and how it translates into someone's sense of identity, yeah. if I've now uh, had sex with a boyfriend, I see myself as less than. My identity is now less than someone who hasn't had sex with her husband, with her boyfriend. And it really robs people of a sense of yeah. whole identity. And it really is so anti-Christian when you think about it. We don't even need to go there. <laughs> Again, um, we're briefly talking about our experience on this video. Maybe in a podcast or maybe even in future videos, we will dive deeper, deeper into, into this. Because there <laughs> is an entire movement around deconstructing um, the purity movement and the damage and the repercussions that it has caused yeah. in people's lives. And so if you are watching this and then you've had an experience with purity mm -hmm. culture and maybe you're here looking for answers, I just want to encourage you 
um, just to get curious and to do your own digging because I promise you there is an extensive amount of research and other people's stories and maybe we'll even link um, some resources available in the description of this video so that would probably be a really good place for you to start yeah. and so and, now yeah. and really quickly even if you don't know if you've been affected by purity culture if you're someone who struggles with shame or self-doubt or you don't have self-trust those can all be byproducts of, of kind of what this culture did so it's worth yeah. it's worth looking and into. also just a side note we're all over the place here but it's good um I think a lot of people are apprehensive to, you know, deconstruct purity movement because they then think it's the permission to go and just to have sex with anyone, anyone and, and everyone everything. All the time. That is not what is we're being promoting. or what yeah. we're promoting or what is being promoted. Actually, if you want to do that, go do it. Like whatever, but that's not what um, that's not what's happening here. Yeah. We're not having this conversation so that you have the permission to go do whatever it is. It's like now, you know, we're both, would, I would say we are very uh, deconstructed Christians, however you want to um, uh, view that term. But it was like the big hang up with the grace message that yeah. hit um, uh, not too long ago. Now that we're teaching grace, we're giving people the license to sin. Yeah. Right? That's not actually what's happening It's a very small here. way of thinking. It's a very that, small way. This if you don't believe this, then you believe this. Yeah, yeah, 100. So now that we kind of touched on uh, a little bit about what is purity movement, it leads us here. I think uh, we'll give each other a little bit of space and kind of talk a little bit more about how purity movement um, infiltrated on mm -hmm. uh, you know parts of our lives. And I know we both have done extensive work of unpacking uh, that, of unpacking that mm -hmm. and getting to a lot of the root trauma that it created in our lives um, because we have seen some heavy symptoms as yeah. a result. So yeah. go ahead. Okay, I'll go first. I, well, I'll share my first thought. <clears throat> I, um, I think the biggest effect that purity culture had on me was that I grew up believing my body was bad. So uh, in, in- This body. This body. This body is not bad. It's really good. In, in purity culture, the messaging is that your body is I bad. Love your body. <laughs> the messaging is that your body is bad. Your body is sinful. It's full of fleshly desires that are going to lead you astray. Don't trust the body. That was said to me a lot. Like, don't yeah. trust the body. You have and to die to self. You have to die to self. Yep. Don't trust the body. So I feel like the, the biggest effect uh, in my life from purity culture is that lie. Like now that I'm outside of that, I know that my body is actually my greatest ally, is always communicating with me, is never leading me astray, so full, full of wisdom. But I think because I believed my body was bad, there were so many, so many effects from that. So yeah. uh, when you believe your body is bad, what are you going to do when you feel bad? You punish it or you mm -hmm. control it. So I had a lot of issues with punishing and controlling my body, which manifested in disordered eating and eating disorders. And really, it led to the sense of I can't trust myself. Yeah. I always felt like I can't trust myself. So it kind of, uh, if you see your body as bad, you're instantly set up to see your body as the enemy. And I, I feel like I lived at war with my body, constantly mm. at war, um, because it was the thing to not trust. So really a huge part of my healing was starting to reconcile that relationship with my own body and recognize how how good it actually is and how it's always on my team and always protecting me. Because yeah. I had spent years thinking this thing is the enemy and I'm over here. And, and you live at war with yourself and that's awful. <laughs> it's yeah. awful. I'm thinking about how even when you look at data or when you look at the science of like what chemically makes us up mm. as human beings, yeah. like even like the work around Brene Brown, let me say it like this, like she talks about how we are wired for connection. Mm -hmm. Like that's what makes us work. We're wired mm -hmm. for relationships. And this is why isolation is so dangerous. Yeah. And we're wired for connection. And I'm just thinking like when we feel so disconnected, like we don't belong anywhere, right? Like where do I belong? I don't fit in here. And you're experiencing deep um, uh, levels of rejection. Like I rejection and the fear of rejection and walking into a room of strangers or the people I knew and you could look at my shoes and think to yourself, damn, nice kicks, bro. I immediately would be like, oh my God, oh my God, what are they thinking about me? What are they saying about me? I lived with this constant sense of rejection. Yeah. And I'm just thinking about what you're saying is, it's taken me years to realize that until we learn how to belong to ourselves, until we learn how to be comfortable in our own skin, then we can begin to experience 
deeper uh, measures of belonging and acceptance in the world around us, which elevates our overall human experience here on earth, right? And so I'm thinking like, wow, that plays a massive role. If you think your body is bad, you disconnect from your body and therefore you're going to live disconnected in every aspect of your life. Yeah. I think too, there's an element of like, if you think your body is bad, you're, like I wasn't telling people that. It was in mm. secret that I think my body is bad. It's an internal war. Mm -hmm. And so it does lead to even external disconnection with humans because there's this part of myself that I'm like trying to keep from other people because it's the bad part of me. Yeah. So I think when, when I'm thinking about purity culture and my experience with it, um, because like sex was for marriage, mm -hmm. sex outside of marriage is a sin. I think uh, I, I'm probably not uh, the only person that experienced this, but growing up in the evangelical church, like nobody talked about sex. Yeah. Like we were sexually silent uh, families yeah. and there was no space to talk about sex, right? Even I'm thinking about the times when we would watch TV and a woman with maybe a low cut shirt on and cleavage, what were we taught immediately to do? Cover your eyes. Yeah. Right? Fast forward. Fast forward, <laughs> whatever it might be. I remember the first conversation mm -hmm. that I had with my pastor's wife about masturbation, right? And I remember asking like, well, if we look at a white wall and masturbate, is it okay? And she's like, sure, if you can look at a white wall without lusting, right? It's the lust now that is sin. So now immediately you equate not just sex with sin, but also self-pleasure mm -hmm. with sin. Right. And so what happened to me is that because sex wasn't talked about, because there wasn't a sex positive conversation happening inside of church and therefore inside of our homes, um, as I began to grow and as I began to mature, all of my sexual desires that are so natural for anybody, mm -hmm. right? As you grow and go through puberty and begin to um, uh, just, yeah, grow, you begin to have different sexual urges, sexual desires, sexual thoughts. And because there wasn't any space inside of the church or inside of my home to talk about these things, I repressed it all. Yeah, you're taught to shut it down. <laughs> you're taught to shut it down because you when feel you ashamed. Because I can even think about the times when I was young and I would be you know, I'd get aroused or I'd have these thoughts. I'm like, oh my God, this is leading me down the path of sin. Mm -hmm. Shut it down, repress it, ignore it, don't talk about it. And then you would be naturally, it would happen naturally. Then you feel so ashamed because you're trying to be a good Christian. Therefore, deep down, you think something is broken with you. And that was a cycle that I learned at a really young age. And I said this, and it's a blanket statement, but I still almost stand by it completely. Um, show me a very, very toxic man with very uh, high levels of toxic traits in his life. And I'm going to show you a man that has repressed his feelings around his sexuality. Yeah, because anything we don't work out, we act out. Yes, And 100%. generally we act it out sideways. And so that just led me down a very dark path. And like I said earlier in this video, it's all kind of blended into my life. Uh, but that just kind of led me down a dark path of being so detached mm. from what I'm feeling, so detached from what's going on in my body yeah. that I was never able to live in the present, right? Because in the present, in my body, in the here and now was bad, was always taught to be bad. And mm. so I lived with mounds and loads of anxiety and worry nonstop, which obviously took a really, really heavy toll on my mental health. Yeah, absolutely. Got another one for us? I got another one. The other uh, effect that I feel <clears throat> was really damaging for my own life is how in the purity movement, the idea was that the man needs sex and the woman, uh, the woman is basically an object for that, right? Like the, the man needs Don't it. Don't cause me to and stumble. And the woman needs to show up for that. So I remember sermons growing up where like this was preached, like wives, make sure you give your, your husband's enough sex so he doesn't cheat. Do you really? Oh my gosh, crazy stuff. But I think the, the effect for me and kind of, kind of how that infiltrated in my own thinking was even, uh, even in dating, I always thought like, oh my gosh, they just want sex from me. They just want sex from me. I wasn't, I wasn't viewing sex as this, uh, mutual beneficial connective exchange as much as I was like, oh, I have to hold on to my purity card as something to protect because if I lose it, I'm damaged goods. So I think kind of even the framework around thinking that sex is for men, that men want it more, which is just 
crazy thinking, but it was so permeated. It really, yeah, it really, uh, again, almost kept me at a, at a level of disconnection mm -hmm. in relationships because it's I, probably cut your, yeah, it's cut your relationships mm -hmm. short from experiencing probably the depth of connection that was possible there Absolutely. because you already had these like pre-made determined kind of assumptions of yeah. like he only wants sex for me. Yeah. And again, touching on what you said, really that sex, uh, the language of sex being bad and yeah. not being able to understand that this is such a beautiful connective experience and kind of reframing it. And I think that was part of my healing work is reframing this as a connective experience. It is probably the most connective experience you'll ever have with a human being. Which is also why it probably should be protected in some ways. Uh, or done consciously. Or done consciously. That's a better word. Yeah. Done consciously. Um, but that was never taught. It was, yeah. it was, uh, it was really <laughs> bad <laughs> teaching. <laughs> uh, I get it. Um, I think, for, yeah, I think kind of what you said, and I don't know if I would, I'll talk about this some other time, but it has, it really has warped my understanding of what sex is mm -hmm. um and what is possible through intimate connection uh, because still today you know I've, I've realized this but because i grew up in that uh, experience of feeling like my natural sexual urgencies or my natural sexual desires uh, are bad that over time has translated into i am bad yeah I've lived most of my life feeling like I've done something wrong Aww. and feeling like I'm in trouble. <laughs> like, sad. I know. Even if you ask Kara, like, I have to, I've had to learn how to stop asking this question because I would always ask, what's wrong? What's, what's wrong? wrong? What's wrong? Are you mad at me? Are you what's mad wrong? at me? Are you mad at me? Mm -hmm. That gets tiring, right? For both parties For involved. <laughs> and so I've always lived with this feeling like something is wrong. Like I'm bad. I've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. And as I have lived with that feeling, it has perpetuated a cycle of self-hatred. Like, why do I feel this way? After even doing so much healing work, yeah. I would still feel this way. It would still be embedded like in my bones. And then that led to deep self-hatred. Uh, and being mad at myself because I couldn't help but to believe that something was so intrinsically yeah. wrong and broken with me, which then led to more self-destructive patterns mm -hmm. and behaviors. And so to really sum it up, I think the, the purity culture for me embedded such a deep level of shame mm -hmm. in my life that not only left me feeling disconnected from my own body and disconnected from my own life, but it also has produce a level of uh, self-hatred in my life that literally caused me to self-destruct in some of the most unimaginable ways that I can honestly say that if I didn't find the courage to ask for help, there probably is a very good chance that I would not be sitting here and having these conversations uh, with my wife and with you. And so, yeah, yeah. that is what <laughs> the purity culture has done for us we're actually running out of time this is yeah. the longest longest video we've, video done. we've ever done i think it. it's good it's good i could keep talking it's so I know. good maybe we'll do a part two yeah so we just want to say thank you so much uh for tuning in if you are still watching this and you get something from this we'll bring more content like this let us know future. in the comments below if yeah. it's helpful and we will link resources yeah. below as and well and also push the damn subscribe button okay <laughs>